Uh, this next tutorial is one in a series about uh, Model Builder, specifically a subsection of Model Builder, which is iterating. Um, you know, so there's a couple of videos on here that go into various elements of Model Builder. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, obviously the videos that aren't here, as you can see, don't dive into some of the very basics the same way maybe we do with ArcGIS. Uh, we may remedy that someday. I'm more trying to teach the next step in model builder because some of the, the the early stuff, how do you create tools, is 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 pretty rudimentary and pretty easy. Um, but there's a lot of really neat things you can do with model builder um, that are hidden just beneath the surface, and that's what I want to spend uh, these videos going on. So this first one's around uh, iteration, and you know what I mean by iteration is really just cycling through something. Uh, this is one of the most common uses for an iterator. You'll often, or sorry, a model. You'll often see somebody have a series of shape files or rasters or tables uh, in a data set, and they want to run the same um, process to all hundred of them. Right? That'd be a really good use of a model, and you do that through what's called an iterator. Um, just like ArcGIS, there's any number of ways you can add these things. You go to Insert, and they're sitting up here. I also like to start it by right-clicking and going to uh, Iterator. Um, you know, what I'm about to say here may seem rudimentary, but I think it's always helpful to look for these small little patterns to help you form a larger understanding of what you're trying to accomplish. Notice ARC trying to be helpful and breaking your things down right into four subgroups. And that will be helpful in trying to learn these iterators because these subgroups tend to do four very different things. Right, for and while are simply um, you know just loops. Right, do the same thing five times. Do the same thing six times. I'm going to jump down a little bit, right, because your understanding of these maybe makes it look like these are the simplest, and then these are the second two. But these ones are actually a little bit more complex. So I'll start up here, and then come down to this grouping. And notice each element in here: data set, feature class, file, raster, table, workspace. These are all file types, right? These are all, um, you know, whether it's starting up at a folder and coming all the way down to a shape file, these are actual elements through which you can iterate. And that's really what you're doing here. Right? Iterate through all of the shape files. Iterate through all of the rasters. Iterate through every data set. Iterate through every workspace. Iterate through every table. These are what you use if, let's say, maybe you had 100 items that you needed to convert from CAD to ArcGIS and they were all in a folder. You'd use this. These two, a little more complicated, but, but really interesting. Feature selection and row selection, uh, we'll get into a little bit in a later tutorial, but really what they do is imagine if you had a feature class you know, with 100 feature parts, maybe it was a neighborhood shapefile, and 100 neighborhoods. This would iteratively go through each neighborhood. Right? So that's kind of neat. I mean, normally we do something like this, and if we buffer right, or do a spatial join, or a raster process, it does it to every component of the feature part. But this can go through one at a time and break apart your analysis based on whatever row you're on. Same thing with row selection, except you do this on a table. And at least for field values, what you're doing here is if you have a field that has multiple values in it, and perhaps in each iteration you want to take a value from a field and do something with it, that's what that's going to allow you to do. So our first one we're going to learn is this little grouping down here. There's no need for me to run through each one of these. I'm going to demonstrate it on feature class, and then you'll be able to use induction to apply that to the larger principle. And so we're actually going to recreate a model that I've done here. whole purpose of this model was, uh, let's say somebody gave me a bunch of data on crime. And that's what we're going to play with here. Someone gave me a bunch of data on crime, and they separated it by month, essentially. So they said, here's all the crime from April, from February, from January, and from March. And I might want to run a density on each so that I can see, you know, how dramatically the density changed month to month and if there were any areas where it grew or where it shrank. So normally without a model builder, I would just run four separate um, kernel density processes. And, you know, imagine that this had 20 in here, right? 30 or 50, that's when it starts to get exhausting. But using an iterator, which you can see here in orange, I'm able to do this in one quick step simply by going to run It'll run through my model, and I should have uh, opened this up. You can see runs through all four of these crime layers here. And very neat, runs back a kernel density, and even neater, takes on the name of the file that's being iterated. And so that's a very neat process right there, ArcGIS doing its 
this is a parallels thing. For those of you who use parallels, I'm sure you've seen this from time to time. Sometime it'll get a little funky. All right, so but each month doing its iteration and taking on the name. All right, so let's see how we would actually go about doing this. Let's start from scratch on our own model here. So as I may have mentioned in a previous video, you can always run models from, from two different areas. Uh, you can run models from in this window, right, where you're building everything within your model window and then you're going to model run. Or you can engage what are called parameters and you'd run a model by double clicking, right, and then you do your inputs like a tool. The model we're going to build here as an example, we're going to build it uh, here in, in, right in our little place. So when I want to do an iterator, first thing I want to do is go to iterator and select my one. Pick feature classes. And I'm a very visual learner. I hope you all are too, to some degree. Uh, you know, I want to pause always in model builder and really take a look at what you're seeing here. Uh, a diamond, or, that was foolish, a hexagon right here. And right, so you got a hexagon. Uh, it's got a little um, kind of cycle thing up here telling you that it's an iterator and it's taking a couple things on as input. All right, so whenever you have something new brought into model builder, it's a good experience to double click it. And it'll tell you what does it need. And it needs one thing, it can accept four. So let's examine what those are. The first thing it's going to need is a workspace or a feature data set. Essentially what this telling you is, sure, I'll iterate through every feature that I find, tell me where to find them. All right, so you're simply picking the folder, the geo database, whatever it might be that is storing this information. You know, if you recreate this at your own home, I don't know where you'll be storing this data but I'm picking the temporary place where I'm storing the data for the video. There it is. Iterate by months, and there are the months, cry months. The three optional ones, wildcard, if let's say you maybe had a hundred different things in there, and you only wanted to do the ones that had your name on it, you could put a wildcard and then put your name. Um, you know, and I think a wildcard uses a combination of, so that would be, you know, essentially my name and then that would be looking for, you know, my name and then any anything can come after that. Feature type's another way to do it. You know, this actually might be helpful to play with right now. I know for a fact that there are only point layers that I'm going to be iterating through, but I might be uh, in a folder that had points, lines, polygons, tables, and I would screw this tool up because density can only run on a point or a line, so it might be helpful to say, hey, I only do points. And finally, recursive is what will happen if you have folders within folders within folders within folders. Recursive just iterates through every folder and subfolder it finds, but we don't need that right now. All right, so I have my folder, no wildcard, and I'm saying only find points. All right, as I point out before, everything lights up. Orange comes a, an iterator. And now it's time to pause for a moment and really break down the component parts that you've created here. You know, I know uh, some of you appreciate this in the video, some of you might want to get uh, to the execution of it, but I really think getting an understanding of these tools uh, means you sometimes have to pause and discuss the structure. This gave you three elements. The first element here, right, and I can hover over it to be uh, kind of confirmed, it's got that blue color of an input. This is the workspace. Whatever you've chosen that you want to iterate through, this is it. So I'll be iterating through it. And let's keep that open so we can see. I'm iterating through crime by months. While this is telling you April, the reason it's telling you April is because, well, that's the first thing it would find coming through that file. Right? You have to not treat iterator like, uh, you know, like some static thing. This is going to run through each of the files. It's going to do April, then February, then January, then March. All right, so all it's saying here is before we've set up anything to run or any processes, right at the starting gate, it knows it'll go to April. So again, as you're iterating, the green is going to be the output of that iterator. And in this instance, the output of the iterator is the specific file, raster, feature class, table, whatever you're choosing to iterate through. And finally, you're going to have something called name. This little tiny teal bubble is what makes iterators work. We're going to set something up and I'm going to pose a logical query at the end as to why or why not the, this iterator is going to work and in that moment I'm going to come back to name. Some of you can already surmise what this is. 
You hover over it, tells you that it's April, gives you a little bit of a hint, but for now let's leave it here and come back to it in a bit. All right, so I am iterating through the folder, I'm pulling out each feature one by a time, and now I need to pass it through the rest of my tool. All right, what did I wanna do? Well, I wanna create a series of densities, and I'm actually gonna delete these so we can recreate them and delete them from the output folder too. Doo -doo -doo. Where did I put those? I think I put them here. Sorry about this, gang. Mm -hmm. One, two, all right, make sure we're all good to go. All right, so I need to pass it through an operation that's gonna run density. All right, so from previous uh, tutorials, remember you can right click and add a tool if you can navigate to the toolbox, or you can simply drag it in from your toolbox uh, or from your search window. Spatial analyst, density, and those not familiar with this can check out the series uh, of videos on uh, density and other raster-based tools on this tutorial. All right, so as we've gone through previously, you drag to connect. Everything's gonna want its various inputs. We can double click on the tool. Does it have a population field? No. Where do we want to save it? Well, you know, we've got a, uh, a field or something on our um, desktop, maybe where we want to save it here. And I'll just call it, uh, you know, density. It's going to want itself to have a cell size and a search radius of 1500. So rather than input the cell size here, I'm going to pause for a moment. Uh, those who remember or you know felt really good about the raster tutorials remember that I'm always reminding you when you're doing raster that you want to make sure that your cell sizes your processing extents and your output coordinates uh, you know which doesn't tend to be as big of a deal because we're using everything with the same coordinate system it'll, it'll output the same but you want those three to always be aligned because that'll assure you that your cells are falling uh, exactly in order for every single layer that you're doing um, you know, so just as a reminder, you can control for a tool uh, those environments, right? So I could right-click this and go to Properties, and, uh, you know, or I could even make a variable from an environment, right? So I can go up here and make a processing extent for my extent, double-click it and say, I always want your processing extent, maybe I'll make it crime sample, something I have here, so that everything's adhering to the same, uh, same processing extent. Give it a second to load here, and I maybe want to do the same thing, um, you know, with a ver with a cell size. So I can come down to raster analysis, say cell size, and I'll come in and say everything should be as specified below 25, knowing it's going to be feet because of what we're projected in. So only reason I'm doing that, and I wanted to call that out to everybody, is just to make sure since I'm going to run through a series of uh, points, they all might not have the same processing extent. They might be close, but there might be one or two that have a, a crime point just a little more north of their neighbor, and so things wouldn't line up exactly. So I'm just ensuring uh, that everything's going to line up perfectly by setting an extent and a stealth size. All right, so now I can run back to it, 25. I'm outputting. Uh, it's going to run through each. I'm going 1,500 uh, feet is my search radius. Good. Now, let's come back to that question I posed at the beginning. If I were to run this now, what would happen? And just pause for a moment and think through how I'm explaining iterator to work. Iterator is going to pop on in here. Whoops. It's going to grab the first thing that it sees, April. It's going to take April. It's going to pass it through a tool called kernel density. It's going to run the kernel density and it's going to output something as video outputs temporary density. It's going to check its box and it's going to go on to the next iterator. It's going to come down and find February. It's going to pass February through the kernel density. February is going to come into the kernel density, and it's going to save itself. Oh, dear. It's going to save itself as video outputs temporary density. Right? Each iteration is going to overwrite the one previous. And so what would eventually happen is you'd only have one output, and it would be the last one. It would be this raster that we did to get density on the March crime. So what we need here is we need a way for the outputs to be relative. 
right, to the outputs to only exist so long as each iterator, something that we can borrow from the original file, perhaps its name. And that's the purpose of this. For each iteration, this vessel, this beautiful teal colored vessel is going to store the name of the feature, the name of the workspace, the name of the raster, whatever you choose, and it's in that little vessel for as long as that iteration goes. So the first iteration, that's going to store April, and under the second iteration, it's going to store February, and on the third iteration, it's going to score Jan, and then it's going to store March. So essentially what we need is a way to extract whatever value is within that vessel. And we do so with something that's called inline variable substitution. So by matching the exact name of the vessel and then putting percent signs around it, we are essentially saying take whatever value is within this variable within this vessel, right? And this works for anything. I could put percent extent percent or percent cell size and this would come back as 25, right? It's whatever's being stored within the vessel. And knowing that, right, I could name this, I could go to rename, I'm not going to do it, but I could rename this cheese or I could rename this dog or I could rename this bacon. And so long as I made sure that I was saying percent bacon percent or percent cheese percent, I would be taking whatever value is stored in here. And because, as I said, it's going to depend on your iteration, round 1 April will be stored. And so kernel density will run, and it'll save something as April. And then the second time, February will run, and it'll output a raster called Febra, and so on and so on. So I can save it, right-click so I can add these to my display, come down here and watch the outputs in the folder that I want to output them in and I can go to model and I can run it and let's actually uh, you know kind of shrink it here a bit maybe put you off to the side so that we can watch you in action go to model and run and then there we go run density 1 febra ajan and march all run all save in my output 1 2 3 4 all have the same cell size and extent pass through an iterator so the key element that I want you to take away from the first video because it's going to come back in our other iterator videos is this concept of inline variable substitution. Really use it a lot in iterators, but you can use it in any model you want. As long as you put percent whatever percent and that whatever is taking on the name of a variable, it will use whatever is stored within that variable. Right? Notice now that it's March because it's gone through its iteration and the last thing it would come across would be something called March.